Hi, I'm Alderman Altenay here with my beautiful parents, Michael and Nellie Altenay, and they do have an extraordinary story. They migrated to Australia in 1970. I was born in 74 as a first generation Australian with Greek, Turkish and Ukrainian background. And it's quite unbelievable to think that all three countries are in our heritage because all three countries were at war with each other at one point, with Greece, Turkey and Russia. So, uh, so Dad, now you've um, you particularly had an amazing story uh, growing up in a lot of hardship in Turkey. Can you just share with us uh, what it was like for you growing up? Well, i love to share with you my life experience. First, I have to start with the part of the history. As you know, Communist revolution in Russia started in 1917 and it lasted five years. In 1922, Soviet Union established and first president was Lenin. He lived for two years and then uh, he died. And Joseph Stalin became the president and he ruled Soviet Union with an iron fist until 1953 when he died. In 1928, Joseph Stalin made the first five years plan of the Soviet Union. And according to communist ideas, all rich people's assets, money, everything confiscated. My grandfather's name is Zakhar Oskilko and his wife Yevgena. And my father was their oldest son, Ivan Oskilko. Now, in 1931, uh, my grandparents were kulaks. Kulak means rich landowner, which peasant work for them. So in 1931, communist authorities confiscated everything belonged to them. Assets, money, the only thing left for them is the house they are living in. Being a rich people, of course, they had a comfortable house. And out of the blue, some communist party members came and told my grandparents, Communist Party needs this house out. A very cold day, and if they stay one night out, they will freeze to death. So they, they didn't offer them any alternative uh, accommodation or anything. So they refused to leave their own house. Wow. They refused, and the communist authorities grabbed both of them and they hanged them on the trees in front of their house. Fortunately, my father wasn't there at that particular time. Later on, he comes, and when he learned what happened to his parents, he was very, very sad. At the time, my father was married with two children. Lydia is his daughter, and Nikolai is his son. So they supposed to be my stepbrother and sister. And uh, my father start talking around his displeasure about uh, communist authorities. Of course, some people went and told communist authorities what he's saying. And then one day, one of his friend, my father's friend came and said, Ivan, please run away. Otherwise, they will hang you too, because of your comments. But he was married with two children. It was a big dilemma for him. If he stay, they will hang him. If he ran away, he has to abandon his wife and his two children. And at that particular time, a, hung, a famine started in Ukraine. And unfortunately, Stalin did not recognize that the famine. He didn't send any help. And in two years' time, 
seven million Ukrainians perished. They die of hunger. Well, my father told everyone that there is famine and there isn't much work over there. He's going to Kiev, uh, sorry, to Odessa, and to find a job and send some money to his wife and children that they are not going to starve. He went and he found a job and he sent first time money for them. But after that, he decided to run away from Soviet Union. But my father wasn't a highly educated man. And he didn't know too much about geography. And the closest country he can run away was Turkey. And Turkey is a Muslim country. But Ukraine and Soviet Union, mostly Christian origin and communist regime, tried to destroy the religion anyway. So he ran away and come to Turkey. Unfortunately, the Turks at that time hate the Russians. They still don't, they don't like the Russians much. Well, in that situation, they start treating my father very, very badly. And my father complained to one of the policemen. He said, I ran away from the communist, but you, you are, they treated me better than you did. You are doing. Wow, the policeman get very angry. He make a report that my father is a Soviet spy and they deported him to Iran. <laughs> but Iran is another Muslim country. What my poor father will do, he come to Iraq and come to Syria. And Syria was under French jurisdiction at the time. And he come to the city of Iskenderun, part of Hatay. Iskenderun is a city located in northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. It is a lovely city, and uh, there was an American oil company called Mobile Oil. So through one of the Russian origin person working over there, he find an ordinary work, he start working there. He didn't tell anyone that he was married and he abandoned his wife and children. He kept quiet about it. And everybody thought he's a single man. Later on, one year after my father left Ukraine, my sister Lydia died of hunger, of famine. But uh, my brother Nikolai, taken by the communists and brainwashed and become a good communist teacher. And eventually he become high school teacher and he become a technical college principal before he died. But I didn't know anything about that, of course. Now, my mother's name is Marika, Marika Sayekh. At the time, my mother, at the age of 15, married to a Greek Orthodox nationality and Greek citizen man called Lambro Limnos. Lambro was 35 years old and my mother was only 15. One year after they get married, my elder brother Nicola born. He was born in 1935. But when my brother was nine months old, his father died of natural illness because at that time the medical uh, medical things were not really very sophisticated. And even from simple uh, diseases, people can easily die. So my mother was widow with a little boy in her hand. And someone said, let's match you uh, uh, met you up with Ivan over there and with matchmaker they met and my mother said if he looks after my son then I marry him 
Well, eventually they get married. I was born in 1938. And at that time, still, Iskenderun was under French jurisdiction. And my father is treated quite all right under French, French rule. In 1939, when Germany attacked France, and in two weeks, they come all the way to Paris. Of course, the Turks take it as an opportunity and they send their army and occupy Iskenderun and Hatay and make it part of Turkey. So in 1939, because my brother, me and my mother born in Iskenderun, so they gave us Turkish citizenship. Because my father was Soviet Union, Union citizen, they refused to give him Turkish citizenship. And eventually, because my father was not Turkish citizen, forcefully, they give me a Turkish surname rather than giving me my father's surname, which is Oskilko. And they translated my mother's surname. Seyek means goldsmith. They make it... Uh, Altuneg, Altuneg means the person who bend the gold. So from there on, I grow up with this surname and my name was Michel. It is, it is a name, French origin, but uh, in French language, Michel is a girl's name as well as boy's name. If uh, it's finished with one L, it is a boy's name. If it finished with double L, E, then it is a girl's name. But both of them called Michelle. So anyway, Second World War started, of course, but Turkey did not enter the Second World War. And uh, they start sending very capable, very good primary school teachers and high school teachers to the newly occupied part of Turkey because most of the people over there, they were either Alevite or Armenian or Greek Orthodox origin. And many of the, some of them, especially Armenians and Greek origin people, ran away and they went to Lebanon or Greece or whatever because they didn't want to live under the Turkish rule. But who stay in Iskenderun? Very rich people belong to Christian religion, and very poor people belong to Christian religion, which they couldn't go anywhere. They didn't have the knowledge or the money or anything. So my father could speak only Russian and Ukrainian and very little Turkish. My mother can speak Turkish, Arabic, and Greek, but they have completely different background and they couldn't understand each other really. Eventually, I have a sister called Valentina and a brother after that, uh, Tony. Uh, but uh, my, my sister was five years old when she had a an accident and she burned and died and uh, Tony uh, gets sick from his uh, intestine and he died very quickly too. I am the only one survived. My father keep wanting more and more children and my mother said what is the use of having more children when you cannot look after them? And this was their I think the biggest argument Eventually, my mother divorced my father. So I was four or five years old when they are divorced. And then uh, the Turks took my father from Iskenderun and make him live on another city. And they refused to tell us from which city they put him in. Well, because the the Turks hate the Russians and they hate the communists. I was very hesitant to talk about my father. Even sometimes in order 
people not to ask me too many questions. When they say about my father, I say he is dead. And nobody asks me any more questions. But my father was still alive. But my father never come to see me. Never uh, send me any letter. Never help me with anything. So I have to grow up with my mother and with my stepbrother, with Nicola. You can imagine at the time in Iskenderun we were living in a timber house has only two rooms. One room for sleeping, one room for the daytime. We cook there, we eat there, we do everything there. And inside of the house there was no toilet. Toilet was in the garden. And we didn't have also a bathroom either. So what we do, we heat water, we put it into container, we go to the toilet, put the chair, sit on the chair and put the water on it. And this is how we washed ourselves. Also, there was no water in the house. In the garden, there was only one tap and we take the water from there. Also, there was no electricity. So in the primary school, uh, we had this gas lamp. So I was studying only with that and the light is not really bright at all. So I was a little kid, I was growing without father. 99% of the Turks are Muslims. And because I belong to Christian family, they call me infidel. They discriminate against us in every opportunity. They, they think uh, if you are not Muslim, you are infidel. So they try to look at us from the top. They try to tease with us and so on. Now we were living really uh, hand to mouth. What do you call, on the, hand to mouth, you said yesterday. Hand to mouth? You were living hand yeah, to Yeah, but uh, they saw. Uh, we, we, we were not rich at all, really. Probably. And uh, my mother was uh, doing a little bit sewing business or a little bit tailoring uh, because uh, she was an illiterate woman. I think I have to tell you a little bit about my mother's parents as well, because this affected me and my brother very much so. My grandfather's name was Nikola Sayeh, and his father's name was George Sayeh. George was a very, from a very famous family and a rich man. There was one village near Arsus called Arab Deresi, or uh, later on they changed it to Arpa Deresi. The whole village was owned by George Sayer. And my grandfather had, uh, there were five brothers. I believe Catherine, Esma, uh, Abut, and Fuat, and my grandfather. My grandfather spoiled very much by his, by his uh, grandmother. Uh, when he got to school, he was very naughty and the teacher punished him. And according to him, he put nuts and he want him to kneel on the nuts under his foot. Of course, this was a very severe punishment and eventually my grandfather, with two of his friends, waited outside of the school. When the teacher came out, they bashed the teacher and they grabbed his uh, gold uh, watch. They went and bought uh, Uzo, or they call it Raka, some sort of alcohol. And they get drunk with it. Of course, after that, they kick him out of the school. My grandfather couldn't read and write. And, and he was very irresponsible man, really. All what he wanted to go to hunt birds and uh, to drink every day one bottle of Raki or Uzo. And uh, 
womanizer and uh, heavy smoker. Uh, so really, <laughs> he was a black sheep of the Sayer family. What happened eventually, all the family members didn't want to have anything to do with him. When they talked Nikola Sayer, they said, he's not from my family. Accidentally, his surname is, <laughs> is Sayer. Anyway, when my father, uh, when my grandfather was about 19 years old, and it was nearly the first world war we start. And there was a rule of the Ottoman Empire at the time. If a man marry a woman from another city, then when they take him to the military service, he served the military in his own city. They don't send him to the front line. So he went all the way to Mersin. It is a city 200 kilometers west of Iskenderun. And he married my grandmother. Her name is Helen. And eventually they come together, but my grandfather wasn't really working effectively. He All what he did, he worked in a cafe, making coffee for the people, and he earned very little money, but he neglected his wife. But they keep having children one after another. They have five children. Marika is my mother, the oldest one, then Stephen, then George, then Christina, then Behir. Behia was the youngest one. Four of the oldest children, none of them went to school. They were all illiterate. Behia is the youngest one. She went to school. She was in the same class with me. I was the best in the class and she was the worst one. She could hardly finish the primary school. And all around me, the relatives, they were all illiterate. <laughs> and we were really not rich at all. Uh, we were living under poverty line. Uh, and really also in a Muslim country, even to survive under the circumstances was a big task. Eventually, when I become six years old, my mother couldn't read and write, and when she wants to write a letter to somebody, she always asks someone to write a letter for her. And she didn't like that. And military service is compulsory in Turkey. So my mother thought she has to send me to school to learn how to read and write. And then when I went to the military service, I'll be able to write my own letter myself. So this was the idea after why my mother sent me to school. But as soon as I went to school, despite of all these negative things around me, every year I started to become number one in the class because I was very hungry to learn and I was asking a lot of questions to the teachers, etc. I was to learn, I was hungry to learn. And eventually, when I finished the primary school, the teacher come and told my mother, he said, please don't make your son to drop out because he is a bright kid. Send him to the secondary school. And at the time, in Iskenderan, there was only two secondary school, one of them vocational high school, but the junior section for three years and the other one, high school against junior park for three years. I was, in 1950, I was 12 years old. I finished the primary school, and my mother is asking me, which school do you want to go? I have to make the decision at the age of 12. At the time, I was always afraid of staying hungry. So I thought for myself, in order not to stay hungry, either I must have a lot of money, or I must have a profession, or I must have a good education. But we don't have money, 
will never have money. And I cannot have high education because uh, everybody illiterate around me and there is no high school and from there to university, all in other cities. And uh, there isn't anybody to support me. So I said the best thing for me to do is to learn a profession. So I went to vocational high school and three years I learned carpentry as well as I studied what they are teaching in the high school. So in 1953, first time my brother started becoming an electrician in a practical way. And there was an American company building some uh, some military uh, houses and uh, barracks, etc., for Turkish Navy because Turkey entered the NATO at the time, so Americans were helping them. And my brother find a job over there. He was earning one Turkish lira an hour, so it was big money really <laughs> for them. And first time in 1953, my brother was able to buy the material and put all the electricity into the house. This is the first time we had electricity. And then, of course, I was start looking for job, etc. And I was only 15 years old. And there was no possibility for me to study any further. No money, no knowledge, no nothing. Uh, 